Welcome everybody. I am Lisa Smith, Executive Director of the Natural Areas Association, or NAA for short. Thank you for being part of our 2022 webinar series. I see that we have um, a lot of folks who are still joining us. I see the numbers climbing. We have a large group today. So I'm gonna go ahead though and get started for those of you who've joined us. We have a nice program for you today. Um, as an organization, NAA is dedicated to getting science-based resources into the hands of practitioners such as yourselves. We utilize a number of tools to do that. Our NAA webinar series, our web, NAA webinars are not just intended to convey information, but to engage practitioners on topics of interest that highlight emerging science, methodologies, and best practices. To that end, we invite you to engage in today's program by posting comments, questions, and even links to related resources in the chat function. We're all used to using that by now to communicate during these types of um, events. Uh, we can often learn as much from each other as we do from the presentation. So we do encourage you to, to, to engage with us. We, as I mentioned, we have a lot of folks on today's webinar and um, a lot of those folks are new to NAA. Uh, and so before we introduce the presenter, I would like to tell you a little bit about our organization and our partnership with Esri. We're excited to be partnering with an industry leader for this webinar. Esri brought GIS to conservation and this early location intelligence tool transformed and expedited our collective abilities to conserve ecologically significant landscapes in the Earth's biodiversity in a mere 35 to 40 years. As a young heritage ecologist in the early 90s, I remember our state's um, first heritage, our state's heritage programs, first ArcGIS system for mapping biodiversity elements. So it's been um, really amazing to watch how this that tool in particular transformed our work. So it is our great pleasure to be partnering with Esri today so that you can learn about tools that will continue to advance your work. And it's thanks to Esri's generosity that we've been able to share this valuable content with everybody today free of charge. So thank you. Allow me to tell you a little bit about NAA and what we do. Our organization serves practitioners and scientists focused on the management of ecologically significant natural landscapes with the intent to protect biodiversity for current and future generations. We believe that protecting nature requires quality science to inform practices on the ground and access to reliable resources that can advance the conservation and stewardship of land and water biodiversity. We do this in a number of ways. We publish the Natural Areas Journal, which is a peer reviewed quarterly publication. The April 2022 issue is currently available through the NAA member website and Bio One if you have access to that. And if you're interested, the journal is currently looking for associate editors. If you're someone who's interested in lending your expertise um, to one of the areas that we're in need, uh, we, we appreciate having you. We, this is a well-established scientific journal and you can learn more about becoming an associate editor on our website or be in touch with NAA staff at info at naturalareas.org. We also host the Natural Areas Conference, and we will be hosting our 49th uh, this fall in person in Duluth, Minnesota. Duluth is located on the shores of Lake Superior, the largest of the Great Lakes. And if you've not been to Duluth, I highly recommend you try to get there. It is an amazing part of our country. The Northeast area of Minnesota is known for its natural areas, offering boreal and hardwood forests, extensive lakes, bogs, and wetlands, as well as Savanna and Upland Prairie. The agenda will feature over 100 presentations developed by and for natural areas practitioners, including keynote and plenary sessions, concurrent breakout sessions, half day hands on workshops, and full day field workshops. We're excited to be in person this year, and we hope you will join us. I know that many of us are excited to be together. Uh, look for registration to open before May 1st and you'll be hearing more, more from us on that. We are also proud to offer both in-person and virtual stewardship and action field workshops. These are designed for small group learning and we film them so that we can uh, create accessibility to this great information for more folks than we can host just on the ground. Our next in-person stewardship and action field workshop focuses on the Minnesota Prairie Plan and we'll visit seven, seven different sites in Southwestern Minnesota where public, private, 
collaboration has been tremendously successful in conserving tall grass prairie. This workshop will take place July 19th through the 21st. It is going to be by invitation only. So if you are a land management practitioner who works in this area, please let us know if you're interested in learning more by emailing us at info at naturalareas.org. Our state natural areas programs were among the first entities to protect natural areas in North America. Almost 50 years ago, these programs came together and addressed a need for a unifying voice in community where practitioners and academics could share information, techniques, methodologies, good science, and even moral support. Our next state natural areas program roundtable will be held May 12th, 2022, and deal with the topic of riparian protection and restoration. And as I mentioned, our webinars are another way to get information to you. Our upcoming webinars include, um, bear with me here, um, Hope for the Hemlocks, uh, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid Management Approaches for Public and Private Lands in North Carolina. That's coming up on May 24th and on June 21st, Fire Ecology in the Upper Midwest, Effects of Fire Seasonality and Intensity on Controlling Resprouting Woody Plants. In July, we will um, have a presentation entitled Join the Crowd, Standardized Monitoring Protocols for Prairie and Savannah, being brought to you by USGS and uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. Sunny Fleming is ESRI's Industry Specialist for Environment and Conservation. With a background in plant ecology and botany, she has applied location intelligence throughout her career from monitoring species in the field and helping state parks manage recreational assets across their systems. She continues to pursue her passion for environment by now supporting others and applying location intelligence to their work. Sunny is presenting to us today via video, and we've done, she's done that so that she could involve more of her colleagues from Esri than would be possible in a live presentation today. So we're loading the video currently, and I'll invite Sunny to show herself because she's with us today. Yes. Hi, Sunny. Thank you all so much for inviting me to partner with you all on bringing this webinar. Um, as you know, natural areas are really close to my heart. I used to work with Tennessee Division of Natural Heritage. Some of my former colleagues are here in the chat, so that's very exciting. And yes, as um, we go through the webinar, I did pre-record it so we could involve some of my colleagues as well and bring them into the fold and provide you all with maybe a little richer, more dynamic experience. But this also means that I'm freed up to answer questions in the chat. So if you have questions throughout this webinar, please throw them in the chat. Don't be afraid. And I will try and answer them as we go along. Well, hello, everybody. And I'm so glad you've joined us today. But what I'm really looking forward to, other than this webinar, is actually meeting all of you face to face in September at the Natural Areas Conference. So very excited about that, finally. My name is Sunny Fleming. And in my past life, I was actually a field biologist. I worked with Tennessee's Division of Natural Areas. It was my first job out of college and it was under the direction of Roger McCoy, who many of you know as the Natural Areas Board President. Now I'm Esri's industry lead for environment, but what does this even mean? It means that I get to advocate for the needs of our users internally here at Esri, but also broadcast your good work to the world. As part of this, I get to help develop visions on how GIS can be applied to the great work that we conduct on our daily basis. I want to extend my gratitude and thanks to the Natural Areas Association for partnering with Esri to bring you all this webinar. The work that we conduct on our private and public lands continues to inspire the work that I do every day here at Esri, which is to support and dare I say evangelize the good work that you all are conducting. So I continue to work to strengthen our community of biologists, land managers, and other stakeholders who practice GIS and embrace a geographic approach. To that end, I've been snooping around online, talking with some of you, and asking my colleagues internally at Esri as I've worked to aggregate examples of the good work you're doing and how GIS is being applied across all facets of natural areas management. Additionally, myself and a couple colleagues I've invited We'll show you some resources available to you now and for free, such as Esri Solutions, to help get you started and uh, easily deploy them and be off and running.
Okay, so are you ready? I'm definitely ready. I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off and we'll jump right into the PowerPoint and some of our demonstrations. I don't think anyone here is unaware of the importance of our natural areas. However, others who might not have always had natural areas at the forefront of their mind are beginning to understand the importance of protecting our land, air, and water. Biologists and scientists have long understood the health of our environment as having a direct influence on our own health and resiliency. The term ecosystem services began to find its way into our discussions as questions around the value of protecting these places shifted to a more anthrocentric perspective, if that's a word. Now, with the impacts of climate change causing very visceral effects, many understand more than ever that not protecting our natural areas has a very real economic and health impact as well. Whether this is impacts of flooding, wildfire, or other extreme weather events on our communities, impacts to supply chains, or increased incidence of presence of zoonotic pathogens, the emphasis and importance of healthy environments is recognized more broadly than it ever has been before. The term green infrastructure, once having a very specific meaning, especially in an urban setting, can now be understood at scale as more than just elements of our built environment, but rather as critical connectivity and sustainable intact corridors at a landscape level that benefit every aspect of our functioning society. Our communities are faced with many challenges these days, and our natural areas are no exception. In addition to the impacts of climate change and natural disasters altering our landscapes and biodiversity's ability to adapt, a global pandemic has both heightened our societal awareness on the value of our open space as an important factor for our quality of life and exacerbated issues that arise from us loving it too much, so to speak. Climate change, natural disasters, and overuse are just some of the challenges we must tackle as stewards of our natural areas if we're going to achieve a sustainable future. This idea, an urgent need to work towards a sustainable future, is embraced more widely than ever before. So while those challenges are one side of the coin, the other side is that there's more awareness of our interconnectedness and the importance of involving our natural world and the biologists and scientists who know it best in conversations that are now cross-disciplinary. What's driving this? Well, I kind of look at it through three major lenses. So first, personal lifestyles. The habits of individuals are changing. In addition to wanting to lead healthier lives, folks are looking to be more involved in volunteerism efforts or strive to make greener personal choices. This is creating a market demand, and this leads to the second area, corporate responsibility. Corporations not only want to respond to this market demand, maybe by slapping on a green label, but they've begun to recognize that there is significant risk for not addressing the sustainability of their products whether this is through social fairness or through the impacts of their supply chains or the risk of climate to their supply, corporations are scrambling to both reduce their risk and illustrate real and meaningful efforts to provide sustainable products to discerning customers. These issues are sharp with us right now as we see global supply chain disruptions from a pandemic and exacerbated by natural hazards and other disruptions. This leads us to the final area, policy. I guess environmentalists can finally thank the market for something. What we've been preaching all along is finally being seen thanks in large part to the impacts it's having on our global economies. We are seeing real and meaningful policies and goals being established globally through COP26, the UN's Sustainable Development Goals and 30 by 30, as well as domestically with the America the Beautiful Act, our own locally led 30 by 30 initiative as well as strong language throughout the infrastructure bill requiring grantees to illustrate both the environmental impacts of their projects, as well as their resiliency and their ability to provide equitable outcomes to all their constituents. This renewed sense of responsibility means that the public, policymakers and corporations are looking to biologists and climate scientists for input in a way that is, I would say, unprecedented. 
Because of this, we have a responsibility to meet these new demands and innovate how we conduct our work and better facilitate communication to non-scientific audiences. This requires us to examine ways to streamline our operations, how we conduct inventories, monitoring, and other field work. How much time are we spending entering data into spreadsheets or other systems from field notes and related workflows? Similarly, how can we better utilize technology to capture our stewardship efforts, not only to be able to communicate them, but then to be able to better analyze their effectiveness? With the America the Beautiful Act now setting a goal for our conservation planning nationally and challenging us to protect 30% of our land and water by 2030, conservation planning requires that we not only communicate and act on where we could protect land and water, but where we should and then provide this information to others in a clear and concise way. That brings me to the last pillar. How do we not only share this information out to the public, to private partners and to policymakers, but also engage them in conversations around this and ensure that we are facilitating collaboration on these topics? Geography, the science of our world, provides the science and the language to support this innovation. It helps us organize and integrate all the environmental factors like biodiversity and ecosystem services and integrate them with economic systems, spatially seeing their connections. It allows us to integrate them with social factors and illuminate their patterns and relationships. It provides us with a framework for understanding and applying our knowledge, shifting our perspective from seeing these three systems at odds with each other and instead revealing the relationships between them and working to balance them. Because these problems are geographic, they require the geographic approach to solve them. The geographic approach is a way of thinking and problem solving that integrates geographic science into how we understand and manage our planet. It's holistic and integrated, it's enriched by spatial understanding, it's collaborative, inclusive, and multidisciplinary. It supports the creation of multi-objective solutions, and it impacts virtually every sector of our society, not just the natural sciences. And how does it do this? Through powerful methodologies, geoanalytics, creating insights and understanding, geovisualization, a language through maps and visualization for communicating the content, geodesign, designing sustainable and inclusive futures, geocollaboration, engaging all the stakeholders, and geo-accounting, being able to account for all the factors, setting up balanced measures that are not only finance-driven. This geoscience and understanding can support our future. It can support our planning, our decision-making, our engineering, our operations, how we manage our individual organizations, and ultimately how we manage the world. So how do we enable the application of the geographic approach? Clearly, Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, enables the geographic approach. GIS and the geographic approach provide the framework for applying this integrated geographic knowledge widely. This is not dots on a map. These are tools we can employ at an enterprise level for every stage of our conservation and stewardship efforts. GIS is critical. Over the next few minutes, we'll take a look at how our colleagues in our environmental community are applying the geographic approach to our four pillars, operational efficiency, stewardship, conservation planning, and civic inclusion and engagement. Through their examples, we'll highlight a number of capabilities of ESRI's geospatial infrastructure and some resources for getting started yourself. So let's begin with operational efficiency. This is a pretty broad term, but when I think back on my days as a field biologist, I think about this as the work we might conduct in the field. So monitoring biodiversity, conducting inspections, developing reports, and similar activities that were core to our daily operations. So much of this work was conducted in tough conditions, weather of all kinds, lack of cellular receptivity, remote areas or potentially unsafe areas or rugged terrain, but we love the work, right? So as tough as it got sometimes, the thing I loved the most was being in the field and not in the office transcribing data. 
whatever tools were available to make field work easier so I could spend less time in the office on reporting, I ate them up. And it's not just me. Let's take a look at some examples. So perhaps I'm over dramatizing, but I think of field mobility as something akin to how the pencil played a key role in prompting the Renaissance. Many organizations are outfitting their staff with smartphones or other devices such as tablets to conduct their field work. Esri's suite of field mobility tools, such as ArcGIS Survey123, Field Maps, or Quick Capture, are being used across a wide variety of sectors and in a wide variety of conditions to allow staff to conduct field work easily and offline. These examples on the slide are just a few of many of how others are using these tools. South Carolina Natural Heritage Program are using field mobility for staff to collect critical species observations in the field, which then easily integrate into their biotics database. Nevada Department of Wildlife completely transformed how they conduct their aerial survey work. What used to be a complex arrangement of biologists yelling out data, someone collecting a GPS point, another writing out the observation, and all of this while a pilot maneuvered a helicopter around power lines has now been streamlined by two applications, Survey123 for pre-flight planning and Quick Capture with an integrated voice recorder for quickly tallying animal herds from the air. The best part, the weeks they spent transcribing data back in the office has been reduced to zero as their ArcGIS dashboard with summary statistics updates as soon as the data uploads back to the cloud. They're able to make management decisions months earlier than they used to, which is critically important for these big game species that are seeing declines. Kentucky Natural Heritage took inspiration from Esri's conservation easement monitoring solution, a free solution that they deployed and then configured to meet their unique needs. It integrates ArcGIS field maps and Survey123 to conduct inspections on properties, and then a dashboard that gives them a more holistic view across all their properties and all their needs. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague to show us what I mean when I say deploy a free solution. Nicole, show us what that's all about. Thanks, Sunny. I'm excited to demonstrate how you can deploy a solution from the ArcGIS Solutions app. I'm here in my ArcGIS Online homepage and coming up to the app launcher, I'll find the Solutions app. Here we have a plethora of solutions that are ready to deploy with one click. Under state and local governments and fish and wildlife, I'm going to deploy the conservation easement monitoring solution today. But first, let's see what it's all about. Conservation easement monitoring was built to streamline conservation easement inspections. This helps easement programs inspect for compliance, manage their relationships with landowners and property managers, and improve their organization's performance and the regularity of inspections over time. Let's check it out. When I click deploy now, I'll see this solution putting down a whole bunch of items in my ArcGIS Online organization, along with the other solutions I've deployed before. This will take a few seconds, and when it's done, we'll have three new information products. Okay, my solution was successfully deployed. Let's check out what it contains. In my new solution item type, I can see the contents. This is really handy, this landing page, because it organizes each of the items in the solution in sort of a nested top-down approach where I can see the layers that are participating in the map. And I can see the map that's participating in the dashboard as well as any layer views. Finally, the solution also contains a survey that would be completed by a field worker who is tasked with capturing inspections of a conservation easement. Let's check out each of these one by one. Here's the conservation easement monitoring map. 
And generally, if I'm a field worker, I would open this up in the Field Maps app. Here in my browser, let me zoom in to this area. Each of these green boundaries represents a conservation easement. So if I click on it, I can see the details of Cunningham Falls, current owner, property manager, acres, when the land was acquired, when the agreement expires, and so on. Each of these points also represents an inspection that's been completed. So we can see the date of the status check-in and any details that were submitted in the survey, as well as photos of the property. If I'm here on site at Cunningham Falls State Park and I want to complete my own inspection, I can choose Start Inspection. This link is formulated in the pop-up of the web map and contains URL parameters that are going to pre-populate different aspects of this survey to make it really easy for the inspector. For example, the attributes of property name, description, location details, and other things that are generally unchanged are already populated, as well as information about current ownership and property manager if applicable. Next comes the inspection itself. I'll check the current uses of the easement property and describe them and also add any observation points. The only required question in this survey is whether or not the inspector noted any possible violations of the easement terms. Finally, I can use my mobile device or tablet to capture a new photo or choose a file that's already on my device. The last step is for myself, the inspector, to sign off on this inspection, as well as the owner or property manager. I can submit the survey and move on to my next easement inspection. Each of these inspections is captured in the conservation easement dashboard, where I can keep track and situational awareness of how many conservation easements have uh, are within my state's boundaries or under my area of responsibility, and how many require follow-up, as well as how many inspections have recently been completed. I can search by the inspector, him or herself, and narrow down by inspection year as well. We could also filter out just those inspections that require follow-up and learn a little bit more about what could be going on at that property, such as undeclared logging that needs to be addressed. In total, the conservation easement monitoring solution delivers a set of capabilities that helps agencies understand property conditions, complete conservation easement inspections, monitor conservation easement programs, and engage with easement stakeholders. That was great, Nicole, thank you. All right, so our next pillar is stewardship. Oftentimes we're acting as both biologists and land managers or coordinating with other entities to conduct various management activities. This can be everything from say, organizing a volunteer weed wrangle, tactical foliar herbicide sprays for invasive species, prescribed burns, or many other activities and restoration efforts. So often we conduct these activities and then have a difficult time tracking their extent, their severity, or their effectiveness. Lacking these metrics can make it difficult to measure and assess their impacts on the biodiversity and habitats we're seeking to benefit. Additionally, sometimes communicating the benefits of these activities to the public or other stakeholders can be challenging if we don't have effective ways to illustrate and show the benefits. This is key for retaining buy-in and support for continuing these important activities, as well as planning and assessing their effectiveness. Stewardship comes in a wide variety of activities. For example, forestry agencies, like this example from the Nevada Division of Forestry, track specific grant programs that help them carry out stewardship activities on both public and private lands. 
tracking both the activity as well as the drawdown from the grant is extremely important for annual reporting to the U.S. Forest Service. Nevada here and many other forestry agencies are using ArcGIS dashboards to easily view these activities across their entire state and report easily to different stakeholders. Field mobility tools come into play here too. Data doesn't just magically show up in a dashboard. The same field mobility tools we mentioned earlier can be configured for capturing your stewardship activities in real time, such as this hazard tree assessment from the US Forest Service that uses ArcGIS Survey123. These same tools can be used internally or even set up and distributed virtually so that the public can participate such as this Adopt a Habitat project out of Boise, Idaho, that allows volunteers to adopt an area and manage it for invasive trash or other blights. But right now, one of my favorite examples comes from the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. They are doing incredible things with their GIS efforts. One such example is illustrated brilliantly in one of many story maps they've published for the public. This one on the Meacham Creek watershed restoration describes the restoration efforts to reverse years of impacts of natural resource exploitation in the area. They used a number of GIS tools to plan and monitor the impacts of their watershed restoration efforts. The efforts were quite successful in restoring conditions to support salmonoid habitat and other qualities of the ecosystem. There are significant amounts of funding set aside in the infrastructure bill to conduct this kind of habitat improvement work. And when organizations embrace the use of GIS, they're much better positioned to apply for these competitive funding opportunities. So how might your own organization get started configuring a field workflow similar to these for your stewardship? Another free to deploy and configurable solution Esri has is invasive species inspections. Originally developed for agriculture or CAPS federal reporting, the same pattern is familiar to all of us who need to track both invasive species and our treatment efforts. Let's take a look at how you might configure components of this solution. Matt? All right, thanks, Sunny. So I've gone ahead and deployed the invasive species inspection solution here in ArcGIS Online. And while it was designed for CAP agriculture workflows, the beauty of the solutions is that they can be configured to meet your own specific needs and workflows. So if your organization doesn't perform pest monitoring, but you monitor other invasive species like plants and animals, all the data layers, maps, and apps delivered with the solution can be used for that workflow too, with only minor configuration changes needed. Now we're going to look at three different components of this solution and show you how to easily configure it to monitor invasive plants. So at the core of the solution is a survey and a data set to collect all of the field information. So we can open up this survey in Survey123 Connect, which is where we build these surveys. We can see the user interface and what questions and corresponding choices your field workers will see. Survey123 Connect also comes with a configurable spreadsheet that lists all of the questions and all of the choices that you can link to those questions. Now, depending on where you live and where you work, the list of invasives will probably be different. And so having this as something that can be easily configured allows you to get up and running quickly. So I'll make a simple change for invasive species in my area and remove all of the other choices. Now I can save my Excel spreadsheet and the Survey123 Connect will auto-update so I can take a look at what my field workers will now see. The new list is now available in the drop-down. So I can publish this survey, and now when field workers open the app out in the field, they can access the most up-to-date survey by dragging down to get the new updates and then clicking refresh on the survey. Now we can go ahead and open the survey and we can see that the drop-down list we modified is now available to our field workers. Let's go ahead and just submit a quick record. And that's it. We now have a form that our field workers can use to collect invasive plants instead of invasive pests. Now data collection is just one part of the solution. We also have web maps and dashboards that can help us understand what's happening out in the field. 
So with one quick adjustment to our web map, we can get it ready for our particular workflow. Instead of starting in the United States, we can go ahead and zoom in to our area of interest. You can see the point we've already submitted is available to us. And it's symbolized by the status that we chose in the survey. So let's go ahead and save this map. And let's take a look at the last piece of this solution, the dashboard. A dashboard allows people in the office to see the status of field work. We don't even have to edit this dashboard to meet our particular workflow because it is configured to consume any data that gets collected. So we can see the map is already zoomed in to the area that we've changed, and the dashboard pulls from the list of invasive species that we've already configured in the survey and that is being collected out in the field. So there you have it. In less than five minutes, we've configured an existing ArcGIS solution for field data collection and modified it to meet our needs with no coding and minimal effort required. With that, I'll send it back to you, Sunny. Thank you, Matt. In addition to stewarding our existing protected areas, we're also tasked with implementing strategies to protect additional lands. So many of these efforts historically have happened in reaction to some event. Land is for sale or land is threatened and the community comes together to take action. While this has worked, we must pivot from reactionary to anticipatory and planned. We need to capture the knowledge we have of our biodiversity and sensitive habitats and apply it to a geographic system that allows us to plan and prioritize our conservation activities. With the goals set forth in the America the Beautiful Act, we need to collaborate more closely than ever with each other and with others, government agencies, nonprofits, private entities, policymakers, landowners, and other stakeholders. The geographic approach allows us to not only do this, but do it in such a fashion that we bring disparate viewpoints together to achieve a common goal. While sometimes bits and pieces of these plans can be found in static documents of a state wildlife action plan or a forest action plan, bringing them together geographically and visually allows us to infuse these plans with additional knowledge of the landscape from multiple disciplines. It allows us to keep them updated and really utilize them throughout the years in a way that reports simply can't provide. For example, in the top, I have a couple screenshots that the Colorado Natural Heritage Program shared with me. Their botanists are using Esri's field mobility tools, such as ArcGIS field maps, to conduct vegetation surveys throughout a watershed where elk rangeland is increasingly coming into conflict with development. By taking their vegetation plot data from field maps, they can conduct spatial analysis in ArcGIS Pro and model winter and summer rangelands throughout the watershed and identify where prime rangeland may be in conflict with development. With these visualizations and data in hand, they are working with ranchers and other landowners to implement conservation solutions that benefit all parties involved. The results of their efforts would not have been possible without a geographic approach. The Nature Conservancy also uses spatial analytics to provide tools like the Resilient Land Mapping Tool, which allows anyone to explore biodiversity importance and other various metrics that can inform and prioritize conservation decisions. Washington RCO are also leveraging ArcGIS dashboards to take their plan and forecast acquisition expenditures based on fair market value of parcels. But my favorite example right now comes from California Natural Resources Agency. California was even ahead of the Biden-Harris administration on enacting legislation around their 30 by 30 initiatives. Using ArcGIS Hub, they have implemented a framework that allows a number of stakeholders to contribute their authoritative data sets around biodiversity and conservation in California. In turn, geospatial tool sets were developed to explore this data without revealing sensitive species information and facilitate public input on their draft conservation plan. All of this was facilitated through a wide variety of Esri's tools and given both context and a singular home with their ArcGIS hub. Conservation planning like this requires that we prioritize and target what we might define as suitable for conservation. This can take on a number of flavors. Maybe we're focused on wetland conservation or stream corridors. 
perhaps in other areas we're focused on at-risk biodiversity or expanding existing public lands. In many cases, it's all of these things at once. Let's check out the ArcGIS Pro Suitability Modeler and take a quick look at how you can utilize authoritative data sets curated in the ArcGIS Living Atlas to conduct your own conservation plan. Okay, I've opened up ArcGIS Pro and I'm logged in up here and ready to conduct some analysis. In this hypothetical example, we're here in Louisiana and we're going to develop a conservation strategy for Calcasieu Parish outlined here. We're gonna focus on wetland protection. So let's go ahead and zoom into our study area. I'm going to turn on some data sets that represent just some elements we might want to consider when developing a conservation strategy for wetlands. This includes land cover, distance from developed areas, distance from areas that are already protected, are wetlands and streams, or maybe a FEMA flood map to consider protecting areas that we should avoid developing anyways. All of these data sets were extracted from data sets available in Esri's Living Atlas. To do so, we can navigate to our portal tab and choose Living Atlas and begin our search. For example, we can search for biodiversity. And we see NatureServe's suite of data sets from their map of biodiversity importance. These data sets can easily be added to the map and extracted for your study area and ready to run analysis against. Like here, where I've created some of these distance from layers by running a quick geo process like the distance accumulation tool. Now that I've got my data of interest ready to go, I'm going to head on up here to the analysis ribbon and find my suitability modeler icon. This opens up a series of tabs that will walk us through conducting the analysis. The first, of course, is to get our suitability model a name. I leave the rest as defaults, like the suitability mode, which is currently set on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the least suitable and 10 being the most. We'll see here where that comes in in a moment. Now I'm ready to move on to the suitability tab. Here I'm going to add in all of my data sets we want to include in our suitability model. So this is where your 1 to 10 suitability scale comes into play. Right now, everything is set to one, but we can change, say, wetlands to a 10. That's most suitable because it's what we're targeting. When I click on land cover, it opens up a new window where we can explore the categories and set our suitability scores there. Let me change the field name to class name real quick. All right, so exploring these categories, we want to adjust the weights. Like developed land will want to set to a one, whereas things that are classified as wetlands or perhaps open water or natural landscapes will want to heighten their suitability to an eight, a nine, or a 10. Once you've got your suitability set for your layers and your categories within the layers, we want to tell the computer, now find me so many acres across say 13 distinct areas that we can target for conservation. We do this using the locate tab. You can set your acres. Let's say you're targeting 30% of your parish's acreage to meet your 30 by 30 goal. Optionally, you can put in a number of regions that you'd like to create. So I'll go ahead and put in, I don't know, 13 here and press run. Let's take a look at the outputs from a previous model I ran in Calcasieu. First is a raster telling us the suitability score across our areas of interest green being the most suitable and red being the least suitable. We can see that this makes sense here. A lot of the areas around the developed lands of Lake Charles are in red being least suitable. And a lot of these areas that cover wetlands or kind of have this riparian zone are shown here in green. Second is an output of potential distinct areas that we can consider for our conservation plan. You can now share these out to ArcGIS online and engage with stakeholders. You can iterate on your model to adjust things as feedback is gathered. And that's how you can go about developing a conservation plan using Esri's Living Atlas and ArcGIS Pro's suitability modeler widget. Let's jump back in to our presentation. So last, but definitely not least, are our efforts to engage the public. Throughout this webinar, I've touched on a few examples already. If you're anything like me, my original intent when I chose biology as a career path did not necessarily include public outreach, and for many of us it may not be our strength. However, it is so important. Conducting guided hikes or tours of our public lands is a great way to engage with other citizens. 
Or how about involving volunteers and in initiatives like invasive species treatments or monitoring efforts? All of this comes with its own challenges, like feeling secure that volunteers have the skills to provide quality data or pull the right weeds. Sometimes the challenge is about getting the word out, communicating consistently, and managing these efforts. A geographic approach also helps in this regard and allows us to really maximize the interest of the public but also spread awareness and gain support from a wider audience for our efforts. When we began this webinar, I discussed how a geographic approach can help reconcile what's often seen as perspectives at odds with each other, economic, social, and environmental. I think the Montana Department of Natural Resources brilliantly overcame these challenges with their use of ArcGIS Hub. When the pandemic hit, Montana could no longer conduct committee meetings face-to-face, -face, so they utilized secure logins for their Forest Action Plan Committee to look at the threats their forest faced geographically. This allowed everyone to see what others were seeing and come together to create a forest action plan that met a wide variety of needs and perspectives. We can use these same tools to promote citizen science initiatives as well and turn them into real and meaningful data sets through the use of an events calendar, dynamic media for facilitating training, and sharing out mobile tools that help quality control the entry of data from our volunteers. For example, the Chicago Field Museum has an amazing Monarch Habitat initiative. They use ArcGIS Hub Premium to communicate about the goals, facilitate training and meetups, provide reporting tools to volunteers, and show their progress immediately through the use of ArcGIS dashboards. Because they're using Hub Premium, their volunteers each have a login to the site, and they're able to easily organize and facilitate communication with their volunteers, myself included. And just when I think I found my favorite hub, another one comes along that I fall in love with. In Peru, a community came together to take action to prevent the destruction of and move to formally protect high elevation ecosystems. Using Esri's field mobility, they were able to mobilize volunteers to catalog the biological diversity of these regions, archaeological sites, and potential ecotourism opportunities, as well as monitor ongoing threats and prioritize which areas to establish for protection. They wrapped all of this up into an ArcGIS hub, and through the use of these tools, they gained support for formally recognizing five oases throughout the region that now make up a chain of protected areas called the System de Lomas de Lima. How inspiring is that? We've shown quite a few solutions in this webinar, and I want to make you aware of just two more. Recognizing the importance of engaging our communities with the natural world, Esri's Recreation Outreach Solution includes an ArcGIS Hub template as part of the free deployment. This hub helps organizations communicate about recreation opportunities, including volunteer events, conservation initiatives, and promote those hidden gems that might help reduce impacts on other overloved areas. It can easily integrate with another solution, our Park Infrastructure Management Solution. This solution is designed to help streamline public lands operations creating and maintaining park asset inventories, such as facilities or trails or other kinds of infrastructure. And the solution allows staff to quickly assess park asset conditions and have an operational view across an entire park system and communicate closures to the public. So let's wrap up. Our community is embracing the geographic approach. You've seen just a small subset of examples from your colleagues today. Additionally, you've seen some Esri solutions to help you get started as well. When we develop these free solutions that you've seen today, we don't do it in a vacuum. I'm willing to bet that some of you on this call have been directly involved in discussing with us what your critical needs are. That input goes directly into the development of these solutions, so I encourage you all to check them out and embrace these patterns for your enterprise GIS deployments. Esri Solutions, for the community, by the community. If you want to learn more, make sure you register for the Esri UC. We are in person this year, yay, and also have a virtual option. 
Our Environment and Natural Resources Special Interest Group is the top attended group meeting at the UC, and we're already shaping up to have a great selection of users present for this year. Additionally, of course, we will also be at the Natural Areas Conference in September. And as a thank you for joining our webinar, we want to let you know about a free for a year offer for Story Maps to share your personal stories of how you champion and enjoy our natural areas outside of your work life. We can't wait to see what stories you tell of your family hikes, adventures, or your own personal volunteer efforts. And let's make sure we keep in touch. You can find me at Esri Sunny on Twitter or on LinkedIn. If you prefer email, that's fine too, sfleming at esri.com. So with that, I think we'll wrap up and start our Q&A session. So thank you all for listening in and stick around. I'm sure there's lots of great feedback. Thank you, Sunny. And um, I just want to thank all of you for your patience today. We obviously had some buffering issues. This was a heavy duty video inside a video kind of situation, but tremendously rich information and um, technologically advanced. So thank you for that. Sunny, thank you. You've answered so many questions in chat. Um, oh, I love it. We've had great questions and people have been really in great, engaged. So that's exciting. Ooh, how excellent. can we sign up for the UC? We've already got another more questions coming. All right. Keep Go for it. it. Sure. So as far as the UC goes, if you just uh, Google for Esri User Conference 2022, you should be able to sign up. Excellent. I will put the link in the chat, getting it now. Super. All right. Any final questions? I there's There have been some great commentary, which we thank you for. I think that's so helpful to want for all for one another. Um, Courtney Gallagher there has a question, how to, how, how to tutorials on these. Yeah. Topics. Courtney, thank you. Also, you've been engaging quite a bit throughout this. And so all of these solutions are available for you. In fact, um, let me see if I can share my screen real quick on the fly. Let's do this on the fly as if we haven't had enough te technical difficulties today. I'll, I'll tempt fate one more time. How about that? So let me go ahead. I'm not sure if I can. There we go. Share screen. Um, can we do that real quick, Moira? Just want to make sure I'm not uh, going too, too off the reservation. Sure. Are you allowed yeah. to see if sharing? Right. Excellent. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. OK. So let's go ahead and share this. And here I am, I'm logged in to my ArcGIS online organization. So here's my ArcGIS online organization. I'm up here in my username in the top right, just to confirm folks can see this, right? Yes. OK, yeah. excellent. And to the left of my username, I have a suite of applications that I can explore. And one of them is called Solutions. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Solutions. And you'll see that right now we actually have 125 different solutions. Now these solutions are really configurations of applications that are available to you. So many of you said that you're already familiar with using field maps, with Survey123, with things like Quick Capture. So this really takes those applications. We identify what are some of these common workflows that our users need to conduct, and we build these into configurations of those applications. So there's no code. They're just kind of stringing together these different applications. So if I type in invasive species, we can see the invasive species inspections here. I'm going to go ahead and click on it. And you can either just deploy it now and it's going to lay everything down for you, or you can go to learn more, which is where you can really read through how to deploy this, how to configure it, um, all of that good stuff as well. So there's definitely some uh, resources and information that we can follow up with in an email after this. And I know some folks were asking about training, tutorials, all sorts of things. So I'll make sure to um, put a lot of those links into that follow up email. Great. I think we've captured everybody's questions, but I I'm going to so give. Too, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. If if there's a burning one that we missed, or um, I'll give you just another thirty seconds here, as I please throw it in chat. But I am going to just thank you all for joining us today. We have hit the top of the hour. We hope we see you at future NAA programs, in particular the Natural Areas Conference in September, where where Sunny um, will be. 
uh, and Esri will be. So, um, and we will be focused on story maps as part of the programming too. So if you have any Yay. interest in learning more about that, be sure to tune in. Thank you, Sunny, so very much. This was tremendous. <laughs> Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Sorry, everyone, for the tech difficulties, but since we recorded it, we will be able to fix those and you'll get the clean copy. So no worries. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Very good. Have a great rest of the day, everybody. Take care. <laughs>